Good afternoon everyone and such a pleasure to have you all here today as we discuss driver interactions with mobile phones. This webinar is proudly brought to you by the National Road Safety Partnership Program or better known as NRSPP in partnership with ARB Group. My name is Cathy Decorus and I look after knowledge transfer here at ARB Group and I will co-moderate this session and provide technical support as needed. And my esteemed colleague, as always, Jerome, is joining me in the studio. How are you, Jerome? Very good today. Thank you, Cathy. Thank you, Jerome. You are, of course, the manager of the NRSPP program. Could you give us a quick rundown for so, those people who haven't heard of it before? Be my pleasure. So the NRSPP has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes across all sectors to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It's delivered by ARB and funded primarily by a government coalition and ARB. So for more information and more tools like this webinar, please refer to the NSP website. And I'm really looking forward to hearing this one. So it really expands upon the mobile phone policy guide and the uh, safe use of mobile phones and vehicles uh, working group we've been running. So looking forward to it. Terrific. Thank you, Jerome. So as uh, per usual, we are recording today's session, um, so that will be available to you upon conclusion of today's webinar, as well as the presentation material that we'll send through. Now, please don't hesitate to get involved and ask questions along the way. It's a very interesting topic today, so we'd like to hear from you. Um, so there is the questions box that you can type your questions in at any stage during the presentation, and we'll, uh, we'll pause for questions along the way. There is also the raise your hand function if you are experiencing any issues. However, we'll move right along and introduce our expert presenters, Mike Regan and Mitch Cunningham. Uh, welcome to you. First up, we have Mike Regan. Mike, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi there, Cathy. Thanks very much for having me. Um, well, for those who don't know me, I'm the uh, Chief Scientist Human Factors at the um, AWRB group. Uh, the Australian Road Research Board, as it will be called um, in the future. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales, and I've been doing research on driver distraction uh, for more than a decade now. Um, I've written a couple of books on driver distraction with colleagues, um, sit on a few expert committees, um, and when I was working in Europe a few years ago, created the um, Driver Distraction and Inattention Conference series. Um, I've just been four months in Boston uh, writing what I think is the first theory of driver distraction. Uh, some people can't believe that you could turn a, an episode of distraction into a theory, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. <coughs> Thanks for having Thank you, Mike. And joining you uh, there in our Sydney office is Mitch Cunningham as well. Hello, Mitch. How are you? Hey, Cathy. Very well, thank you, and thanks for everyone uh, for joining us today. My name is Mitch Cunningham, and I am a behavioural scientist here at ARB Group. I've been here for about a year and a half now, and I work closely with Mike on a lot of distraction and uh, human factors projects. So thanks for having me, and look forward to it. Terrific. Thank you, Mitch. And I'll, I'll hand straight over to both of you to, to get started. Let's get it on. OK, thanks a lot, Cathy. Um, is there any way of uh, determining whether people can actually hear me okay, given that it's a webinar? We can hear well, Mike. Yep. Just have to assume you... Okay, I'll just have to assume you can hear me, and if you can't, um, right please write right right Okay, thanks. Okay, so today I'm just going to talk um, initially about driver distraction, um, generally, so we understand what we're talking about. Uh, then Mitch will talk about uh, mobile phone use and driver behaviour. In particular, particular, he'll talk about uh, the sort of performance degradation that we get with uh, mobile phone distraction uh, and also some of the um, uh, increases in risk associated with different uh, interactions with mobile phones. And then I'm going to talk uh, briefly at the end about the management of uh, driver distraction. Uh, from the perspective of a, um, a company uh, employer or fleet manager who has people driving around uh, for work purposes using mobile phones. So we'll talk together for about 30 minutes or so and then we'll have some time uh, for discussion. 
I, I think there's enough converging evidence now um, around the world to be able to say with some degree of confidence that distraction is a significant road safety problem. That wasn't so a decade ago, but it's certainly recognised as a problem now. Um, if you look at data from the US, um, quite recent data, only about uh, a year old, about 18% of uh, injury crashes in the US um, derived from uh, driver distraction. About 10% of fatal crashes derived from, fatal, from uh, distraction. And about 14% um, of the 10% of fatal crashes involve cell phone use. Um, here in Australia, um, we don't have a lot of um, a lot of data. There was one good study that was done recently uh, by the Monash University Accident Research Centre, um, in which they uh, classified different forms of inattention, uh, including distraction, uh, from a, uh, a what's called an in-depth crash study that had been undertaken. Um, and when they looked closely at the data to determine what forms of um, inattention were involved. They found that inattention generally contributed to about 58% of the crashes in that study sample, and about 16% of the crashes were due to driver distraction. And interestingly, they found that about 70% of the distractions uh, that surfaced in the analysis of that crash data uh, were considered uh, voluntary distractions. So uh, the kinds of distractions that, that people expose themselves to um, where they had some choice in whether or not to do that. So, so the data, I think, both in the US is complementary. A government survey was uh, carried out a couple of years back and found that in terms of the prevalence of phone use uh, here in Australia, about 93% of drivers in that sample um, owned a mobile phone. Uh, almost 60% reported using the phone while driving and a bit over a quarter of drivers reported using a hands-free kit. And uh, so we're, we're talking, you know, nearly 75% in that sample um, using the phone uh, while they're holding it. And, and we'll understand in a moment um, why that is problematic. Um, when you take into account um, the fact that there are 24 million Australians uh, at the moment, uh, about 32 and a half million mobile phones, yeah, um, sorry, did someone ask something? No, I don't think they, anyone can because <laughs> they can't hear. They heard something. Um, and, um, and what? Oh, okay. And so basically, um, we've got more mobile phones than we have Aussies. And so when we're talking prevalences of 59% uh, using the mobile phone while driving, we're talking about a lot of people and a lot of phones. One of the things that's uh, interesting is to compare the, the prevalence of mobile phone use compared to other distracting activities. And in a recent study by Tom Dingus and his colleagues in the US, um, if you can see this graph, you can see that of all the things, of all the time that people spent uh, being distracted in the car, the thing that was second most distracting um, was interacting with a mobile phone. So, so not only are, are people lots of people using phones, and not only are there lots of phones out there, but when they're taking trips, they're spending a lot of their time using the mobile phone. We, everyone talks about driver distraction, but not everyone possibly understands what, what it actually means, and there are many definitions that have been uh, coined in the literature. This is one from a peer-reviewed paper that I wrote with um, David Strayer, who's a professor in the United States, who I've done quite a bit of work with. And, and, and for us, and, and, and quite a number of other colleagues around the world who've coined this um, same definition now, it's the diversion of attention away from driving or activities critical for safe driving toward a competing activity, in this case a mobile phone, which uh, may result in inattention. So it's not always the case, according to that definition, that if you are distracted, you'll be inattentive. Uh, but most of the time, that is the case. There are various uh, mechanisms of distraction that I'll talk briefly about now, so you've got a better understanding that during an episode of distraction, what's going on. And that will help to make sense of what we talk about 
um, as, the, as the talk goes through. By triggering factors, we mean uh, factors that trigger someone to divert their attention away from the phone. And so, as many of you will, will appreciate, um, one of these is driver state. So if you're feeling bored, if you're travelling on a freeway and it's monotonous, and this is especially so for truck drivers, um, the phone is a pretty useful thing to actually speak into uh, to keep you awake. Truck drivers do it a lot and so, so do the rest of us. Another aspect is, another triggering effect is what we call driver needs. And so what we mean by this is that it's often the case that the driver feels compelled to want to be distracted by a mobile phone so that they can communicate with people, get information from people, um, and uh, basically keep connected with the rest of the world. And then there are other factors um, that are more to do with the properties of the distraction source itself. Um, which can distract people. So the sound of a mobile phone, when it rings, for example, will distract someone, and uh, most likely involuntarily. Um, a lot of things will distract us um, involuntarily. Um, the sound of an ambulance, um, the sight of something unexpected that uh, happens, the erratic behaviour of a driver in a traffic stream. Um, you can't but help to be distracted by some of these things. And the things that um, distract you involuntarily are, are likely to be more dangerous because you're less likely to be able to plan ahead for these sorts of um, distractions. The diversion of attention um, when it occurs can interfere or interrupt with driving or activities critical to safe driving. And, and the interference that that creates um, will be greater if you uh, divert your attention for longer so if you look at a phone for a long time or you think about it for a long time, that's more likely to interfere with driving. Uh, the more frequently you divert your attention towards, in this case, the phone, the more likely it is that it will interfere with driving. And then finally, if the diversion of attention from the phone um, coincides in time with an activity critical for safe driving that's um, unexpected, so for example, um, the car ahead suddenly breaks for no apparent reason um, and the activity critical to safe driving for the driver is to slam on the brakes. Um, you won't be prepared for that if you're distracted and we know that distraction mainly causes crashes when unexpected things happen and people are inattentive. People talk about different types of distraction um, and I don't totally agree um, with the way that um, people differentiate the different types of distraction. Um, but for today's, purpose, for today's purposes, to keep it simple, I'll talk about the types of distraction that are normally talked about in the literature on distraction. In relation to the phone, this can be a visual distraction, uh, which, which most people would say takes your eyes off the road, but in fact it takes your eyes and your mind off the road. Um, if you're looking at a phone to send a text message, um, you'll be thinking about what you're doing when you send that text message. So to say that something takes one's eyes off the road um, certainly doesn't exclude the fact that your mind is probably um, and invariably off, off the road as well at the same time. People also talk about what we call cognitive or internal distraction and, and that, that really means having your mind off the road. So that's having your attention off the road. Um, and as I said, the driver, a driver's mind off the road, can, the driver can have their mind off the road um, as well as their eyes off the road at the same time. And finally, people sometimes talk about biomanual or, or biomechanical interference. And this normally refers to the fact that if, you're, um, if you've got one hand off the wheel to eat a hamburger or to hold a phone, um, it's more likely that that will interfere with your ability to be able to steer the vehicle especially if, if it involves some sort of an emergency manoeuvre that requires quite uh, controlled steering. Uh, it's also the case that you get interference effects that occur if, for example, um, you're trying to uh, adjust the, the volume on the radio and you turn the dial to the left. Um, it, it's instinctive the way the brain works that your steering wheel might go to the left at the same time. And that's the case of, of what we call structural interference or dimensional interference. 
So, so with a phone, it's, it's, it's taking the eyes off the road, taking your mind off the road, and, and this creation of environmental interference that can be um, the main issue. One of the things that people don't often think about is the fact that when we do take our eyes off the road, or our mind off the road, or our hand off the steering wheel, um, but this, this can occur, this can interfere with driving, but, and, they, and people I suppose understand that, but, but people don't often will um, think about what driving actually involves. And a guy called Arvin Brown from Cambridge University a few years ago uh, tried to define what are the high level activities uh, that are critical for driving. And as you can see from this slide, they include route finding, in other words, working out where you've got to go, uh, with a paper map perhaps, or, or with a satellite map system, which makes it easier. Uh, following the route that you've got to follow, and uh, that's much easier if you're familiar with the route. Um, steering and velocity control. Um, collision avoidance, which is where most of the research has been done on the effects of distraction on driving. Um, Traffic rule compliance, so distraction can interfere with your ability to, for example, detect that traffic lights are changing or that they're red or could um, uh, result in you not stopping at a, a set of um, stop signs. So there are lots of different ways in which rule compliance can be affected. And, and interference from a mobile phone can also disrupt vehicle monitoring and by that we mean uh, monitoring things like your speedometer uh, and other uh, instrumentation in the vehicle that need to be uh, periodically monitored to drive. So, so when we think about eyes off the road, mind off the road, and hand off the wheel, um, those behaviours can affect any one of these um, functional activities of driving. And the degree of interference that is brought about um, really will be a function of the joint demand of driving and phone use. So if, if the driving is um, resource intensive, if it's difficult, and if the um, phone activity is complex, like texting, uh, there'll be more interference. Um, if driving and using the phone um, compete for what we call the same uh, physical or mental resources, so for example, if, if uh, you've only got one set of eyes that you can use to look at things, any one thing at the one time. And so if you have to look at a phone and look at the, uh, the road at the same time, there'll be competition um, uh, by the road and by the phone for vision. And that would be a problem. And similarly for other, for other parts of the brain itself. And how the driver distributes their attention between driving and the phone is another factor that, in, that uh, will influence the degree of interference. So for example, if they do spend a long time looking at the phone, rather than having uh, brief glances between the phone and the road, um, then there will be more interference. To finish off this final bit on mechanisms, I just wanted to mention that um, there, are, there are various moderating factors, um, <coughs> and I've, I've referred to these in some of the literature that I've published um, with others, um, that will determine how much interference there will actually be um, when a phone distracts you. Um, and they are things like driver characteristics. So we know, for example, that uh, younger drivers, uh, from an exposure point of view, are more likely um, to want to use a mobile phone than older drivers. So they will be exposed more to distraction. Um, but in addition to that, uh, they've got less uh, spare attentional capacity available to deal with um, distraction because distraction does involve that diversion of attention to other things. And they will be more effective than, say, someone like me who's a bit older and more experienced by the same source of distraction. So two people can be presented with the same source of distraction, but it can be more distracting for one person than the other. I've mentioned driving task demand. So, of course, if, if the driving is tough and you're in a high workload driving environment, perhaps going through an intersection, then if something distracts you, it will have more of a, an effect on driving performance and safety than in a uh, less demanding environment. The demand of the secondary task itself will increase the level of distraction, and Mitch will talk about that. So if you've got a, uh, an activity like texting that takes your eyes off the road, 
your mind off the road and a hand off the wheel if it's manual texting. And that's a very high demand activity. And if you spend a lot of time looking at it and thinking about it, and a lot of time with your hand off the wheel, it'll be more distracting. And the final thing is self-regulation. And what we mean by that is that drivers themselves can adapt to some extent uh, to compensate for the effect of the distraction. So at one level, for example, they could decide to turn off the phone and then they won't be distracted at all. At another level, they could decide uh, that when they drive through, the, through an intersection, they'll, they'll tell the person at the other end, look, I've just got to stop talking for the moment because the workload's high and um, I just need to focus on getting through the intersection. Um, and at another level, they could slow down, they could um, increase their... Um, inter-vehicle um, headway between themselves and the vehicle in front to give them a greater margin for error. So people can do that, and we do that all the time. Uh, the problem is it doesn't always work, and that's why there are so many distraction-related crashes. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't train people, and I'll talk about this towards the end of the uh, talk, about ways in which you can improve people's ability to self-regulate. Um, so that's all I wanted to say at this stage, Cathy, and, and um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them before I hand over to Mitch. We've got actually a really good one here, um, and it doesn't really relate to uh, <coughs> I guess actually driving in the car, but it's worth touching on the other other people who use the road, and this is from Nigel. I'm also interested in pedestrian distraction from mobile phones. Other speakers have to comment. And just a quick add-in, uh, I met with someone from Yarra Trams a while ago, and they were mentioning this is a, a growing problem uh, in particular to them with the pedestrians being distracted by mobile phones. Yes, it is a problem, and there's plenty of research to own to uh, indicate and to prove that uh, when pedestrians are distracted, it uh, degrades their, their walking performance in this case and can compromise their safety. It means that they fail to detect things that they should be detecting, um, they'll walk out onto a road without detecting, for example, that there's a vehicle approaching. Um, they will walk straight through um, pedestrian signals when they're red, for example. Uh, so there's quite a lot of literature on that. I know as a, a cyclist, I cycle to work and back every day, and one of the biggest problems for me is distracted pedestrians because they're not detecting non men, and so I've got to be uh, super vigilant to make sure that um, uh, that I don't run into them because they're unaware of me. Um, and then from a, a driver's point of view, uh, distracted pedestrians are also a problem because uh, just as I have to look out for them, and I know when I see them that they won't be aware of, of what's going on because their, their mind won't be on the road. In their case, they're probably still looking around them uh, for danger. But the problem when you've got your mind off the road is that through an interference mechanism that we call inattention blindness, um, they might actually see things going on around them, um, but, but they won't actually physically see them uh, and attend to them. So they might see a car, and they'll register that it's there physically with their eyes, but because their minds in La La Land, they won't respond to the vehicle, and then they might get hit. So it's an increasing problem, um, and we need to do something about it, especially um, because of these um, you know, risky interactions that it creates between them and other road users. We're getting a massive flurry of questions coming through. And um, I'll let you know, there, there are some who, uh, John, you made quite a few comments. Uh, they will be addressed later in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, got a good one here from Frank. Uh, he asked, uh, I see many drivers texting at traffic lights, stuck in traffic. Is this OK? Well, it's not OK from a legal point of view because you're not meant to to uh, touch your phone in order to do that, uh, even when you're stationary um, at traffic lights. Um, but if you're going to do it, that's probably one of the um, one of the more safe um, times to do it in the sense that the vehicle's not travelling. And so at that point in time, you're not having to um, uh, look out for a danger. The problem, though, um, in doing that, of course, and we see it all the time, is that people um, will be looking at their phone, thinking about attending texts. The next minute the lights change. Um, if the person behind them expects them to travel through the traffic lights and, and they don't, uh, I've seen many crashes occur for that reason, that the car behind just rams into you thinking that you'll 
to go forward. And it's actually happened to me. I've been tail-ended um, by someone I wasn't actually texting myself. Um, I had someone else texting when they rammed into me, but I've seen people being rammed into when they're, when they're texting. So and that's a problem, I'd, I'd say, but, um, but it's illegal. Um, thanks for that. We'll do one more question and we'll move on. And some of the questions, once again, will be answered a little bit later on and I'll draw them into the next sort of sec section. Um, so I've got one here from Rod. Is there any reason from an offence perspective why two-way radios are not treated the same as mobile phones, especially considering a phone has a hands-free function and a radio does not? I think that's a really excellent question um, and it's a question I've been asking road authorities for, for many years because a two-way radio is actually a bit more complicated uh, to use and does require manual interaction um, for most uh, devices. Um, and so I think the only reason why it's allowed is because it's classified legally as a uh, worker's aid, I think, in the um, in the regulations that relate to uh, mobile phone extraction. Um, but certainly the evidence I've seen, and based on the theoretical issues we talked about at the beginning of this, um, this talk, um, using a, a two-way radio will take at least one hand off the wheel, it will take uh, the mind off the road, and it will probably take your eyes off the road when you're, um, when you're trying to locate the position of it within the vehicle unless you can reach for it without looking at it. Uh, and so it's essentially no different from a, a mobile phone which uh, is easy to talk into and could, and, uh, um, and uh, in most cases with a, with a cradle is hands free. Thanks for that. Uh, Jim went a bit further to clarify my question. I on road, mind off road equals having a hands free phone conversation. Okay, Mitch, Mitch is going to talk about uh, that shortly, but essentially the literature shows that there's, there's no real um, difference between having a, a phone conversation when you're holding the phone and when the phone is hands-free, as far as the literature um, uh, is concerned. Um, but the problem is um, that if you get yourself into a sticky situation, and you don't have that both hands on the wheel for steering control, uh, then that will be problematic. And there hasn't been um, research specifically on that topic that I know about. So the research has really looked at the effect of the conversation on, on these different activities, including safe driving, uh, but not on steering control itself. So I, I predict it would affect steering control if that is the right experimentation. Thanks though, Mike. Uh, we should probably get moving on here from Mitch now. Thanks, Jerome, and thanks, Mike, for uh, sort of stealing my thunder there. Um, so I'll be, I'll be in this segment, I'll be talking about uh, giving everyone an overview on the impact of mobile phone use on driver, driver behaviour, so more specifically, uh, when drivers are using their phones for different things, how does that impact on their driving performance, and how does it impact on their safety? Um, the, the likelihood to have a crash on the road. So it's no surprise that people are using their phones uh, in allowing numbers behind the wheel. And a primary reason for this is that phones these days offer a limitless, uh, limitless number of driver interactions. Uh, smartphones are now capable of holding unlimited apps. Uh, they allow drivers to use social media behind the wheel, to Snapchat their friends, update a Facebook status, uh, they have millions of songs at their fingertips through apps such as Apple Music, uh, Spotify, and so the potential for distraction uh, from the mobile phone is constantly present. So this is an interesting uh, graph that you can see on the slide from Jerome, uh, showing the number of driving-related hashtags from on Instagram from 2011 to presently. So for those who aren't familiar with how hashtags work, it's basically a type of label. Um, that you put on a picture or a movie once you have taken it or filmed something. So it's safe to assume that drivers taking pictures behind the wheel would often assign or would be more likely to assign a driving related hashtag to it. So as you can see there is a clear increase in hashtags which may reflect increasing numbers of driving of drivers behind the wheel being comfortable taking pictures and using social media. So drivers aren't just talking texting behind the wheel anymore, they're, they're taking pictures, they're taking selfies, 
and they're also filming things. So it is quite uh, remarkable and scary at the same time. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about texting. So when we look at handheld texting on the mobile phone, and when I say handheld texting, I, re I mean uh, conventional texting that we're all pretty much uh, familiar with. Um, it's an interaction with the mobile phone that is consistently shown to impair driving performance to a significant degree. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm restating the obvious, but the research time and time again shows that when we text um, text message on the phone, we look away from the road a whole lot more. We're poor at detecting and responding to things on the road, and we also display uh, impaired control of our vehicles within their lane. So text messaging, text mex messaging is uh, particularly dangerous uh, because it takes our eyes off the road to look at the phone, our mind off the road to think about what to communicate, and our hands off the wheel to type. And so the combination of these uh, three behaviors severely impairs performance. The decrement in driving performance uh, we see when writing out a te text message uh, is generally greater than that for just reading a text message, which may reflect the extra resources to require to correctly compose a message uh, when behind the wheel. We need to use our fingers to touch the right keys, etc. So it demands more uh, resources from the driver. And in one study, a simple message such as, I'm on my way home, took drivers, and experienced drivers might add, um, took them around 37 seconds to compose. Uh, when driving, and 20 second, 26 seconds um, were, were spent looking off the forward roadway. So it's remarkable to think about the time people spend looking away from the road when they are writing longer and more complicated messages. Things get a little better when we look at text messaging using our voice. So when I say this, I'm talking about using uh, Siri and other voice detect phone applications, which are quite commonplace on phones today. So you speak into the phone and a text message magically appears on the screen. When we compare this voice texting to manual texting, we do indeed see some benefits. The drivers are better able to control the vehicle, um, and it also keeps their eyes on the forward roadway a lot more. However, when we compare voice texting to not texting at all, it still impairs performance. So the take-home message is that texting using Siri and other voice applications uh, still takes mind, our mind off the road and produces a level of cognitive distraction. Um, and this is, this is what can, can impair performance. Um, these voice apps are supposed to take, or to leave our, our eyes uh, on the forward roadway, but it can still take our eyes right off. And this is, big, and this is because we, need to verif we usually need to verify the message as we, sh we can, I'm sure we can all appreciate that um, Siri is not perfect and we all, there's usually some auto corrections in there. And so, we need to double check that and what we're saying is actually communicated in the text message. So it does take our eyes off the road and we can get a bit annoyed at the system for not doing it correctly. So there's other things to consider here. So what is the safety risk when we're text messaging uh, behind the wheel? And so text messaging is one of the driver behaviors that has been consistently shown to increase the risk of having a crash in real, in real world studies or naturalistic driving studies but the driver is filmed over months and vehicle data is collected, which, is, which allows us to see what happens in the seconds uh, before a driver may have a crash. So here, the, the, there's a number of naturalistic driving studies shown before you on the slide, each showing the crash risk when text messaging behind the wheel. Um, the crash risk of just one, um, of course, there is some crash risk involved with just driving, and other values represent the risk of having a crash compared to this baseline value. So these are odds ratios. So, for example, you'll see for Clow and colleagues 2014, um, this study found that drivers that text message behind the wheel were 3.87 times more likely to have a crash compared to just driving. Um, again, these are, these are all expressed in odds ratios, and in this context, the high odds ratio reflects a greater risk of having a crash. If we jump, and, and, and I'm very happy to chat about how these uh, odds ratios are derived mathematically offline. This will take a little bit more explaining. Um, so if we jump to Olson in 2009, right at the end there, we see that text messaging uh, was found in this study to be associated with a 23 times increase in crash risk. There was also another study here using truck drivers, I think by Sigman, finding that text messaging behind the wheel um, put drivers at risk at 167 times uh, the risk of having a crash compared to just driving. So the statistics are remarkable. Um, the safety risks with manual text messaging are couldn't be clearer and couldn't be more consistent across studies in the fact that it does increase crash risk. 
Surprisingly, not many studies have looked at the link uh, between social media use and driving behavior. However, the, the, the few studies that have uh, that have looked at the link, um, I found that I found similar types of performance performance decrements when, say, writing a Facebook message or updating your Facebook. Um, they're similar to those uh, associated with text messaging. So you, people have poor lane keeping ability and they're poor at detecting things uh, like hazardous events on the road. And I guess this is, this can be very much expected. Uh, these interactions, using a Facebook, writing a message on Facebook, uh, demand the same behaviours from the driver. They take our eyes off the road, they take our mind off the road, and they take our hands off the wheel to compose the message. So perhaps not many surprises there. And unfortunately, no naturalistic driving studies, uh, to the best of my knowledge, have targeted social media use while driving. So this may be because social media use may be hard to discern from other activities such as text messaging if all we have to go by uh, is video footage of the driver. So we don't exactly know um, the safety risks associated with social media use while driving. So it's something for future real world studies to explore further. So now on to phone conversations and this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Um, there is a wealth of literature out there examining the impact of phone conversations on driving performance and they bring mixed findings to the table. So I wanted to direct you, uh, direct your attention to two meta-analyses which brought a whole bunch of these studies together and drew some conclusions based on all the findings as a whole. Um, the first by Horry and Wickens, they found that phone conversations impacted driving by uh, delaying our reaction time to hazards on the road. Um, when, we were, when, when people were speaking on the phone, they actually they, they couldn't maintain their speed properly, so they were a lot slower than other people. And this may reflect the type of compensatory behavior as these drivers would recognize that talking on the phone can be dangerous, and so they compensate by slowing down as they think it's uh, safer. And people talking on the phone tend to miss things and they commit more driving errors. A later study by CARED added to these findings and, and they, they added to these funds by suggesting that when we speak on the phone, our reaction time to things on the road um, is delayed by, by about 0 0.14, 0 0.3 to 0 0.33 seconds. And this depended heavily on the demand of the conversation that they were having. So, for example, having a casual chat with a friend compared to trying to follow directions someone else is providing to you on the other line. So, different conversations um, uh, impose a different level of cognitive distraction, depending on how much you have to really think about it. Um, and so there may be many different mechanisms of interference that could account for these delayed reaction times to things on the road, um, as Mike alluded to before. One being inattentional blindness, um, which is the looked but did not see effect. So when we are cognitively distracted, such as when we talk on the phone, um, we, we sometimes fail to process and therefore respond to things that are right in front of our eyes. So things are right there, but nothing's registering, and so we don't uh, we don't pick it up at all or we pick it up right at the last second and have to break very hard. So that's one uh, process of uh, mechanism of interference there. So do these decrements associated with handheld mobile phone conversations, primarily that of delayed reaction times, uh, translate into increased crash risk in the real world? Well, the answer is that we aren't too sure yet. Uh, some studies have found that conversations don't increase the, the risk of having a crash at all. Um, others actually suggest that speaking on the phone uh, reduces crash risk and has a type of protective effect. So actually, so having a conversation while driving is actually safer than just driving. And it wasn't really until uh, it wasn't until recently that study found that conversing on the phone more than doubled your risk of having a crash uh, by a factor of 2.2 to be specific. Um, and so there is a discrepancy here between between the findings of the real world studies, and I'm happy to discuss these and why this may be the case. Um, with anyone interested offline. Uh, contrary to popular belief, hands-free phone conversations aren't much better, if at all. Uh, studies have consistently found that conversations, despite whether being on a handheld or hands-free phone, are no different in their ability to impair driving performance. And this is because conversations, despite holding the phone or not, create a level of cognitive or internal distraction. Uh, when we're having the conversation, whether it's hands-free or handheld, we think about what we want to say, we how to, uh, how to say it, and process what is communicated back to us. And this takes attention away from the driving task. 
And like handheld conversations, the real world driving studies has had mixed findings in terms of whether hands-free conversations actually increase crash risk. So we don't actually have a clear picture of the risks involved with hands-free conversations just yet. So what do we do about the problem of drivers using their phones behind the wheel? Do we, do we ban all phone use altogether? Well, the research may suggest that this approach may not necessarily be fruitful. This graph uh, that you can see in front of you uh, came from a recent study by McCartan in 2014 showing the link between collision claim rates before and after a phone ban in Connecticut, which is depicted by the squiggly blue line, uh, compared to comparison states with no ban uh, depicted by the squiggly red line. So, and as you can see, after the ban was uh, in place, we don't see a reduction in collisions as one would expect. Uh, in fact, we see a sudden increase in crashes. And there's a number of reasons why bans may not be uh, effective. Uh, one, firstly, people may think they can safely manage uh, phone use and driving, so they don't think the phone, the ban should apply to them. Uh, secondly, it may force people to be extra sneaky with their phone use and use it in their laps, as you can see in the bottom right picture, um, which can take eyes uh, completely off the road and may inadvertently increase crash risk. And so these people are using their phones uh, in sneaky ways because they don't want to get caught by police. Um, so the bans may not be all that effective, and so we need another approach we'll meet, which Mike uh, will touch on next. But I think for now, this might be a good time for some questions. Certainly. Where do we begin? There's, there's so many of them. <clears throat> um, well, let's fire away first of all. Uh, we'll go up to... Here we go. Um, so I'm just searching through. Uh, I'm also... Uh, here we go. Uh, so there's a question here around the naturalistic driving studies, and they found 65% of crashes, the near crashes, are, are due to the distraction issue. Um, and they were saying a lot of the ones in pre-2006 did not involve social media. Did you want to comment about that? Um, but what we can say is at the moment that we don't have any um, what we call odds ratios um, which um, the statistics, if you want to call them that, that give you a sense for the increase in risk associated with engaging in a distracting activity, whether it be talking on a phone, uh, dialing a phone, uh, texting on a phone, uh, for these, these uh, social media uh, type technologies. Um, when we talked about the 65% figure before, uh, from naturalistic driving studies and also from um, the analysis of in-depth in crash data, um, that's for inattention and uh, not for distraction specifically. Um, normally we find that distractions are contributing factor in a smaller number of, of um, crashes, probably around about 15 to 20 percent depending on the study, um, and that cell phone use will be a, a smaller proportion than that in terms of its um, contribution to crashes. Um, but I think, I think Mitch has underscored already the fact that um, we don't know a lot about increases in risk associated with driver engagement in social media activities, but if those activities pay eyes off the road, mind off the road, and a hand off the wheel, they will be just as risky as texting. Thanks, though, Mike. And just a question on that. Is there a compounding risk at all? So say the weather's bad and I'm on the phone and maybe I've had a bad day as well. Does that sort of increase the odds for, for a greater uh, crash? It does, and it's a very good question, Jerome, because um, we're only at the stage of sophistication in, in collecting and analysing data, particularly from naturalistic driving studies, to be able to um, uh, make those sorts of um, investigations. Um, but you could say from first principles for sure, um, as Mitch has alluded to, if, if you're engaged in an emotional telephone conversation, we know that that will be more distracting. Um, as I said before, if you're in a high um, complexity, high demand driving situation and you're distracted, um, unless you're able to self-regulate, which is often not the case in complex environments, because you don't have much um, room to manoeuvre in, in very dense um, traffic, um, with lots of things going on, so that will be more distracting, and, and if the boot is a thunderstorm going on and um, you're, you're distracted in some way, some way by a mobile phone, 
uh, it'll be even worse. Um, so I think the I think the answer is is yes. Um, all of these things uh, can come together to increase distraction, um, but we're not yet at a stage of sophistication in, in the search um, terms in being able to quantify uh, the compounding effect and their effect on these so-called um, odds ratios. Thanks, Wayne. I guess just to turn on its head from a different angle now, um, before I ask the next sort of question, what about if I'm running late for a meeting and I have the phone number pre-dialed in, uh, to where I'm going and I'm running late, can it reduce my risk on the road if I'm actually able to call the person and say, I'm running 10, 15 minutes late, I'll be there soon? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it can. Um, well, obviously, if, if you are running late, you do you already have that message ready to go, so that that's not going to take much attention off the road. Um, the act of actually picking up your phone, dialing it, thinking about who you need to dial, thinking about how you're going to communicate you're going to be late, and, and, and sometimes stressful um, emotions that come with being late already can definitely compound into being more dangerous behind the road as opposed to just having something ready to go, as you said, something ready to dial or send off. So yeah, I think that's a, a good uh, self-regulation um, strategy. Thanks, Mitch. And just before we move on, a um, question here from Tammy. Tammy. Is there a difference between talking to a passenger two hands on the wheel and talking hands-free on the phone whilst driving? There is because the passenger is right there with you and so they appreciate the driving context. They appreciate if you're going through an intersection, they can appreciate if traffic is heavy and so they can stop talking when they can appreciate that it might not be safe for you to be, to, for the driver to be talking. Talking to someone, whether it's hands-free or handheld, on the other line can't see where you're going. They can't see where you are. They can't see what sort of road environment you're in, whether it's snowing, whether it's raining, and so they don't they don't self-regulate their their conversation with you. And so they'll continue to talk, and you'll continue to try and juggle the two uh, juggle the two um, tasks. So it is safer. It is safer talking uh, with a passenger because the passenger can appreciate what you're doing and stop talking when they they need to stop talking. Excellent. There are Excellent. Other factors as well. There are actually other factors as well, Jerome. Um, one of them is that a lot of our communication is non-verbal, <clears throat> and so uh, when you've got a passenger next to you, um, there's there's uh, communication going on that um, is, is sometimes um, you know, to do with uh, being able to, to, to sort of see that person intermittently and what they're doing and um, what they're conveying to you. Um, so that's one factor. Another factor is that uh, reception can be more difficult uh, over mobile phones and so it may not be as easy to hear people on the phone and, and the more, uh, and the worse the reception is, the more uh, mental resources are required to concentrate. So, so that can take um, uh, more attention away uh, from driving than just um, uh, talking to a passenger. The other thing too is that um, there are often social imperatives when people perhaps have, have their boss at the other end of the phone um, rather than with them in the car just to continue a conversation and, and not to self-regulate at times when they know they should because they feel that they don't want to um, you know, with the person at the other end of the line or, or upset them. So you, you've got all of these factors that come into play when you're talking on a phone that aren't necessarily going to be present when you're just talking to a passenger. Excellent. Thanks for that, Mike. I think we're just we're getting close, um, running out of time, so we'll move on. And for those who don't answer the questions, we can shoot them to Mike and Mitch, and, and they will come back and answer them as well. So I think Tammy should be happy with that. So all yours, Mike and Mitch. Okay. Well, thanks, Jerome. Um, I'm going to take back control of this um, talk now, and I'll try to finish reasonably quickly. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before we go on that I forgot to mention earlier on when I started is that normally when we present a um, set of slides like this, we would reference the uh, literature from which uh, the information has been derived. Uh, we were asked not to do that for this presentation so that it didn't get so cluttered. Uh, but we do have the original presentation, and so if anyone wants the original reference sources, which are mainly peer-reviewed journal articles from which um, this information has come from, 
um, please contact uh, Kathy, I think, um, or, or Mitch directly or myself, um, and we can provide that. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, a few things about the management of risk from mobile phone use um, from a company perspective, because this whole webinar came about because of uh, the excellent work that Jerome has done as the leader of the National Road Safety Partnership Program um, in developing this mobile phone use policy or, or safe or safer mobile phone use policy, which provides practical advice uh, to employers on what they can be doing to manage uh, the risks that can derive from using a mobile phone, which Mitch has uh, outlined. Um, I can say as a, as, as a distraction expert that it's an excellent document. Um, we had some input into that, Mitch and I, and so we don't think it's excellent just because we had input, although I'm sure it's made it a little more excellent. Uh, but it is a very good document and, very, and it provides some very practical and useful advice. And it's quite unique in the world. I haven't seen another document like this. Um, and so what I'm going to do is to um, just give everyone in the audience a bit of a flavour for uh, the sorts of advice that's contained in that document. Um, one, one important uh, part of the document refers to the sorts of messages that we can be giving drivers, very simple messages to keep them safe. And so you can see on the slide there. Um, always keep your eyes on the road, and, and all of these will make sense now to you because I've talked to you about the theory and Mitch has talked to you about the consequences. So you can see why these messages are important. Um, never text, write or read while driving, because of course that takes uh, eyes, mind and even hand off the, off the, uh, the road, the steering wheel. Um, use a cradle and, and uh, know how to use it and how to install it uh, to be able to talk hands free. Um, use your smart car features such as uh, Bluetooth and uh, voice activated dialing and, and that sort of stuff. Um, it's important that people don't automatically answer the phone that rings. So they should consider the traffic and road conditions um, you know, at the time in making a decision about whether they, they should answer it. Um, and, um, and of course, they should let people know on the other end of the phone, uh, as Mitch was referring to before, that uh, they're driving, and so that people need to understand that uh, there are times in which um, they want to, um, you know, turn down the conversation or stop talking uh, completely if they if they need to. Um, and uh, of course, if if people pull over, um, make sure it's safe to do that, and um, that you're not putting yourself at risk and putting other people at risk when you. Uh, pull off the road, especially if you do it suddenly and stop at a place where um, you know, someone could run into you. Um, and it is particularly important also when you're on a phone to be aware of vulnerable road users. And I think we underscored this point before, as Mitch was saying, uh, one of the sub-mechanisms by which um, distraction uh, interferes with driving is through these more subtle um, psychological mechanisms like inattention blindness. So, um, you know, if you are cognitively distracted and there are lots of uh, pedestrians around you, you might physically see them, uh, but you, know, you might not respond to them because your mind's in love them. So we need to keep that firmly in mind. There are quite a few things from the employer's perspective that can be done to uh, manage driver distraction from, um, from phones and to, um, to ensure that the risks are reduced as far as possible. Uh, one of them is to as we say in the, as we said in the, um, the document, to establish a baseline. So that's basically to determine how existing policies, procedures, and technologies are used by employees, and how effective they are. And if you if you get a hold of that document, um, the uh, Australian, Australian Fleet Management Association or AFMA um, has a survey, an online survey that organisations can use. Uh, to, to help establish that baseline, to um, work out what the existing uh, phone habits are of people um, that are in your company who are using phones, and, and also to collect information on how managers are, are interacting with workers um, while they're driving. The second thing that can be done, of course, is um, in the, the second thing is education. 
Uh, there's a lot that employees can do. Uh, education is important so employees understand and accept the risks associated with using mobile phones while driving. They need to know the content of the company's policy, the expectations of them when they're using a phone, uh, penalties for using a phone if they exist, uh, the risks of course, any legislation that's um, specific to that company, um, and, and generally strategies for minimising distractions through self-regulation as we talked about before. And even things like pre-start vehicle checks to make sure that um, people know how to um, activate Bluetooth connections and so on. So education is very important. Uh, training is important. Um, that's really about making sure that we're developing people skills they need to manage um, mobile phone use safely. And, and again, as I said before, um, even even it, it doesn't occur to some people who are less experienced that there are ways of self-regulating in response to uh, use of a mobile phone to compensate for the effects of distraction. So we could be uh, giving them uh, skills training in that area. We can be training right, them so to optimise. Right? If we could just skip along, sure. so I've got some great questions. I'd love to dive in um, and grab before we sort of wind this up. So we can sort of move through quickly. Um, I can then, there's a plethora of them here, so I feel guilty not getting them out. Uh, no problem. Okay, well, I'll just go through very quickly then. Um, collection, monitoring and analysis of critical incident data is really just about collecting data um, to make sure that you've got a handle on the extent to which mobile phones are a problem. Enforcement's really about just making people aware of what the company policy is and what the penalties are for not adhering to those policies. Um, mobile phone selection and apps is really about saying it's important that an organisation chooses phones and apps carefully to minimise distractions, so choose phones that are easy to use, for example, and user-friendly. Um, and finally, with vehicle purchase and design, that's really all about just saying um, choose vehicles that, um, if they have inbuilt phones, have features like hands-free, voice activation and that sort of thing. Um, and if you're going to choose a vehicle, of course, choose the safest vehicle you can so that if someone is distracted and they do have a crash, that they will be cocooned. And finally, um, there's a so-called whitelist of best performers in this document, which gives people advice on um, which types of phones um, are going to be uh, giving people the best reception to minimise uh, you know, mental workload associated with poor perception and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, and thanks to everyone, uh, to everyone for listening, and back to you, Joe. Certainly. So thanks for that, Mike. So first question I want to really jump in on here, um, sort of scroll back through. Uh, first one is we'll get from Jim, um, which is probably one of the questions sitting out there. Why do the dot points for managing the problem for the driver condone hands-free usage when driving? We just heard this is just as much of a distraction as handheld. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that question. Could you say that again, please, Durant? Certainly. Why do the dot points for managing the problem for the driver condone hands-free usage when, the dri when driving when we've just heard that it's just as much of a distraction as handheld? I think what we can say is not as much of a distraction um, in the sense that it's been shown through research that the risk of taking your eyes off the road is greater than taking your mind off the road. But taking your mind off the road is, is still um, a distracting activity. And the more engaging the, um, the conversation, if it's a conversation, or if there's even voice activation of uh, technologies, that will still take your mind off the road. What, what this policy is about is saying that um, if people are still allowed to do that by a company and if the law allows it, there are things that, that can be done to minimise the level of distraction both visually and cognitively and um, from bimanual interference by having a hands-free kit, for example, to, to reduce that risk. I think that's really what this, uh, the management is about. It, it won't eliminate the risk because I, I, I don't think there's ever a situation in which there is no risk in using a mobile phone for any purpose. Good answer. Yeah, Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to add as well, just quickly, 
The thing about having a handheld phone, I think maybe the conversation, the distraction due to the conversation itself might be similar, but it's the actual act of um, when your handheld phone is ringing, it's not usually right there in front of you. It's usually in a bag or, or on the seat next to you. So you have to look at a way. You have to look away to answer a handheld phone. And you have to go and grab it. A hand-free phone, a hand-free phone on a cradle is right in front of you. So the eyes aren't taken off the road, but they're just directed maybe to a slant. Um, to the side of the Ford roadway to see who's calling, and then you and so you know where exactly where the hands-free phone is, and so that distraction of actually finding the phone, getting the phone, pressing to answer isn't isn't as much of a problem with a hands-free phone, if at all. Thanks, for that, Mitch. So this this question I think is is really different. So thank you, Neil, for this one. Um, I know of an organisation which has introduced a practice where workers, having finished a night shift at 6 a.m., are able to ring a support worker and talk them on their way home, presumably to help keep them awake. Does this sound like a good idea? Um, well, I'll make a comment, and Mitch can make a comment too. It's certainly a good idea about a fire research, because we know that if you can stimulate people by talking to them, for example, through a phone, um, it will reduce the likelihood that they will fall asleep at the wheel. And so when we talk about these protective effects from mobile phones, what we suspect is the case is that they're probably having the effect of reducing the likelihood of a fatigue-related crash rather than a distraction-related crash when someone's talking on the phone. But Mitch might like to have something to say about that as well. Yeah, no, I agree, Mike. The phone conversation in that context could probably give the driver a second wind. Um, and, and again, this is, this is one of the main hypotheses of the protective effects of having phone conversations that some studies have found is that it does bring, um, it does counteract fatigue and it brings attention, um, brings you back to life in, in, in a sort of way and, and, and this allows us to pay more attention to the road and juggle uh, a mild conversation or, or not a very demanding conversation um, as well. I just, I'd just like to add that you know, you wouldn't want to be encouraging people to have phone conversations for hundreds of kilometres after they've finished the 6 a.m. shift. Um, so, you know, it's got to be a sensible policy if it's a short trip home, and this is a way of keeping them stimulated on a short trip home, that's fine, but if it's a long trip, uh, I think a fatigue expert would probably say it would be better to um, take a bit of a bit of a nap uh, before uh, continuing the journey. Um, which is probably uh, even more likely to, uh, you know, uh, rejuvenate you after a after a night shift than um, just talking. Excellent. Thanks for that, Mike and Mitch. I'm very sorry we haven't been able to get to all of the questions. There's been so many of them coming through, uh, and thank you all for your time today. So, maybe you want to flick through to your contact details, Mitch and Mike, and I'll hand back to Kathy. Thank you, Jerome, and thank you everybody for getting involved. We could have a whole other webinar just based on the on the questions that have been asked alone. So, uh, so perhaps I will talk Mike and and Mitch into that. Maybe a, a Q and A session next time. Um, if we can't do that, then we will get to you back to you via email. But thank you so much to Mike and Mitch for taking the time out and and putting together this great presentation today. Much appreciated, and thank you very much, Jerome, for for bringing us this as part of the National Road Safety Partnership Program. Good afternoon, everyone. Have a lovely day, and see you next time. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Jerome, for moderating, and please feel free, anyone, to give us a shout over email with any other questions or anything a bit unclear. We're happy to help out. Terrific.